Good morning, Victory. How are we doing today? Awesome. It's exciting to be back. I feel like I've been gone for a hot minute. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know me, because you have been coming to the church for the past couple months, uh, my name is uh, Pastor Daniel. Um, I'm one of the pastors here at Victory. I'm happy to be back. Uh, me and my family have been doing a lot, been uh, traveling. I've been speaking at some conferences, things like that. And uh, I just calculated it, and I realized that I haven't preached here on a Sunday for a quarter of a year. Last time I preached was the beginning of December. So if you guys thought I preached long when I was preaching every week, um, I preached a lot longer when I haven't preached in a quarter of a year. Uh, so I've just been saving up some stuff for you guys. Not a good joke. It didn't land. Okay, moving on. Segway. <laughs> Uh, before we start this morning, uh, there's a couple things I want to pray for. For those of you guys uh, that love this church and love what God is doing here, I have a little bit of a news flash for you. Uh, there are some other awesome churches out there as well. Can we get a hand clap for that? Yeah. Um, and we have some friends at some other churches in uh, Lee County um, that I want to pray for this morning. Number one is we have a, a dear pastor friend in Fort Myers, uh, and he just got over some, uh, some health setbacks. And so today is his first week in a while uh, being back and preaching at his church on Sunday just due to his health. So we want to pray that it goes well. Uh, that God continues to heal his body and he's able to continue to do what God's called him to do. And also there is another church in our county that is launching today. Today is their very, very first service. Uh, I've been in communication with their pastor, just talking with him, and we just wanna pray that God does awesome things for them as well. So join with me in prayer as we pray for these uh, brothers. God, we thank you so much that you're bigger than just our city. We thank you that you're doing works all over this county and throughout the world, Lord God. And God, we lift up our friends, Lord God, these pastors and their churches and other communities, Lord God. God, that you would bless them, God, that you would pour your spirit out upon them, Father God. Uh, God, that our friend in Fort Myers, God, as he gets up to preach today, even though he's feeling well and he's recovered, Lord God, that you would just continue to provide healing to his body and uh, empower him to preach the gospel boldly and to do what you've called him to do. We pray for this new church that's launching in Fort Myers as well, Lord God, that they see amazing success, that people come experience you, God, that lives are changed uh, by that church in that community, Lord God, and we just ask that you bless them and do amazing things as you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you guys, we're gonna be hopping right into the message today. And uh, to get started, I wanna share a story with you guys. Uh, this is a story about uh, a man uh, that lived back around the turn of the 19th century, so the early 1900s, and his name was R.U. Darby. I don't know what the initials stand for. I just know that it's hilarious if you have the initials R.U. and then anything, because I can just have fun with that. Are you Darby? No. Are you Daniel? Um, and just we can go back and forth forever. So if there's anybody in here and, you know, your name is uh, Robert Ulysses anything or whatever, like, I'm just going to make fun of you. That's, uh, that's the way this goes. Um, but this man's name was Are You Darby, and him and his uncle uh, got caught up in the gold rush. Anybody ever hear of the gold rush? And it was a time in American history where everybody was going to go out and make their millions. And, and, and they, were, they were excited that they were going to go out and they were going to find gold and they were going to be rich and powerful and successful. Anybody ever dream of that? You ever dream of being rich? Come on, put some hands up. Put some hands up. Put them up really high. Be like, yo, that's me. You caught me. I do. So, some of you girls, you know what I'm talking about. Like you, you, you dream of being Ariana Grande or something like that. You like start singing in the mirror and you realize that you can't sing for anything, which is why you're not on the worship team because we heard you back there. Um, just kidding. Wasn't supposed to say that. Let it slip. Moving on. Um, but we all have dreams of like making it big, of, of, of being rich and just being able to live large, you know? Like we just dreams of making money and, and we'll finally be able to, you know, make it rain at McDonald's, you know, and, and, and stop ordering off the dollar menu and actually like, you know, take our kids and be like, hey, you want a Happy Meal today, sweetie? Mama got you, you know? Mama, mama won, won the lottery. And we all have dreams of, of making it big and, 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 and being wealthy and, and having all of our needs met. And so these, these gentlemen, they decided that they were going to just leave everything behind and that they were going to go out into the mountains and begin prospecting for gold. And so they went out boldly and ventured off and, and took their, their mules or, you know, whatever they rode back then. And they got up into the mountains, they started digging for gold, and they started looking for it, and they're panning in the water, and they're digging, they're doing all this stuff, and they are committed. Every day they wake up in the morning, and they start psyching themselves out. My brother's in the room, you know what I'm talking about when you wake up in the morning, you gotta psych yourself up for the day. Ladies, you ever see your husband in the morning, and he's just in front of a mirror, he's like, 
don't interrupt him, okay? He needs that. That is his personal time. If he doesn't have that, the day's gonna be awful. Don't stop it, okay? He needs that time. You just move on with your bit. Just act like you don't see it. Just put your head down and you go on and do whatever it is that ladies do to get ready in the morning. But men need to look into a mirror and we need to imagine that we're rocky. We need to play Eye of the Tiger and we need to pump ourselves up for a minute. So that's what these gentlemen did every morning. Every morning they wake up. We're gonna get gold. Are you gonna get gold? We're gonna get gold. And then they go out and they start digging and they start prospecting for gold. And every day they wake up and they do the same routine and they pump themselves up and they, they chest bang or whatever that's called. And, <laughs> and finally, one day, they're digging. They just stick their shovel into the earth and it makes that, that normal shovel sound when you put a shovel into the dirt. And it's like, you know, I'm really good at sound effects, just so you guys know. I practiced that all night in the mirror. They toss the dirt and they toss the dirt and they toss the dirt and funk. Well, that was a different sound. We either hit coffin or we rich. And they dig a little bit more and they brush the dirt back. And lo and behold, Eureka! It's gold! That's exciting, right? How many guys would be turning some backflips? It doesn't matter how old you are, you're gonna do a backflip, a somersault, whatever you gotta do, they just found gold. They found gold and they're excited and they're running around and they're, they're doing cartwheels and somersaults and they're excited and they start digging out some of this gold and they realize there's a lot of gold here. There's a lot of gold. And they start to brush it back. And finally, they connect enough. They decide, man, we have to take this. We have to have somebody look at it and tell us if this is, if this is good. Tell, tell us if this is what we think it is. And so they collect it and they take it into a city. And somebody looks at it. And the person that examines it says, you know, this gold is so goldy. It's, it's good gold. You know, like, I don't, I don't know how gold works, but there's, I guess, some better gold than other gold. I don't know. Like, this is not gold-plated. This is not the gold that they sell you at Walmart. You know what I mean? Like, it's not the kind that, like, you, you scratch it, and then it's silver underneath, and you're like, you tricked me. This is the good stuff. And the person looks and says, wherever you got this has to be rich in gold. This is probably going to lead you to one of the largest gold deposits that we've ever found in this country. How many guys acknowledge that's some ridiculously good news? Am I right? Amen. They do the cartwheels, backflips all over again, and they realize if we wanna get all this gold, we're gonna have to get some tools. We're gonna have to get the equipment. We're gonna have to get some drills and some, some more shovels and some carts. And, and we're gonna have to start really mining and doing this right. And they realize that this is going to be a very, very expensive endeavor. And so they go back home and they begin to beg everybody they know to loan them money. They go to every bank they can, every family member they can. They be like, hey, grandma, remember you forgot me for Christmas? I remember you, you owe me some money. Hey, remember when I loaned you that money so you can buy that new scooter? Yeah, give it back, it's time, your time has come. And they start going to everybody and they start getting everything they can. They sell everything that they have. They go to banks and they get loans and they borrow as much money as they possibly can and finally they have enough money to start. And so they go and they buy the land and then they buy the, the mining equipment and the drills and everything, and they go back to where they found their gold, and they begin to drill, and man, it's exactly what they thought. There is so much gold. And they begin to pull it out, and, and day after day, they wake up and they go and they begin the process of drilling, and they're pulling out more gold and more gold and more gold and more gold, and, and they're beginning to see those dollar signs, and they're imagining all the things that they're going to buy with their money. You guys, you, you, I mean, we're in tax season right now, so you guys know what that feels like. Am I right? Am I right? You guys are like, I'm going to fix my crack windshield. I'm going to get myself some new basketball shorts. I'm going to live large. <laughs> and then one morning, they go out, and they turn on the drills again, and all of a sudden, they realize there's no more gold. And they begin to panic. They aren't even sure if they've pulled out enough to pay back all of the debt that they've 
accrued. And they begin to dig furiously. They're like, we have to, we have to get more. We have to get more. We have to, we have to find more. Something's wrong. And they begin to dig. And they go out the next day and they dig and there's still no gold. And they go out the next day and they dig and there's still no gold. And they go out again and again and again every single day. Seven days pass, eight days pass, and every day they're going out and they're feeling a little bit more discouraged, feeling a little bit more defeated. They're feeling a little bit more hopeless. And finally, after many days have passed, they look at one another and say, our luck's run out, and now we need to cut our losses. Anybody ever been there before? I just need to cut my losses. I've invested too much time, too much emotion, too much energy into this, and let me just get out while I'm ahead. So they decide that they're going to cut their losses, and they begin to close up the camp. They sell off all the gold that they had, and they realize that they still don't have enough money to pay back everything that they borrowed. And so they realize that they have to sell all their drilling equipment And if they sell everything, they should be able to about break even. And they try to sell people the drilling equipment and sell people the land, but nobody wants it because there's no gold there. Nobody wants used drilling equipment. And so finally, they go to a a gentleman that owned a scrapyard in the city, and they go to him and say, listen, we have this drilling equipment. Nobody wants it. Maybe you can use it for parts. You can break it down and use the scrap, whatever. We're just looking to get some money out of it so we can finish paying our debts and go home. And so the scrapyard owner buys the drilling equipment for pennies on the dollar, and they tell him, we'll take you up to it, it's up on the land, and they go up there, and the scrapyard owner asks them, "And what are you doing with the land? And they say, well, we're selling that too, do you want that? And he buys the land for pennies on the dollar. And then they leave, and they have enough money to go home and finish paying their debts and break even. And the junkyard owner looks at the giant crater in the earth that they dug, and he gets an idea. So he goes into the city and he finds a geologist and he brings a geologist back. And the geologist begins to inspect the dig site. He's looking around and after a while he comes to the scrapyard owner and he says, what happened is the people that were digging this mine didn't understand what a fault line is. Now a fault line can come and cause shifting rocks and sediment to come in between the gold vein and they ended up encountering what was known as a fault line. So it was other rocks and things that had inserted itself between the gold vein. And the geologist said, I believe that if you keep on digging, you just might encounter the other side of the gold vein. And so the scrapyard owner turns on the drill and begins to dig. And three feet from where they stopped, he encounters gold again just three feet in from where R.U. Darby and his uncle stopped drilling, he encounters what ended up being the largest gold vein that was discovered in the United States up until that time, and he became a millionaire many times over. And you guys are sitting in here right now like, (laughs) You know that feeling, don't you? Where you pass on something and somebody else benefits. You know what it's like. It's devastating, isn't it? And this morning, my encouragement for you as you're on this journey called life, as you're following the roadmap that God has set out for you, is do not quit. You're just three feet away from your promise, you're just three feet away from victory. Are you listening to me this morning, church? See, one of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when you're overtaken by temporary defeat. I want to let you know defeat is rarely permanent, and victory is often the result of perseverance. How many of you, you've ever been knocked down by something before? I want you to lift your hands up, and I want you to keep your hands lifted up high. You've ever lost something. You've ever experienced grief. You've ever felt like giving up. You've ever been hurt. You've ever been broken. You've ever been taken advantage of. You've ever been betrayed. Put your hands up real high. Look around this morning. Look at everybody who has their hand raised. I want to let you know something this morning, church. You're still here. You're still here. 
Whatever set out to crush you did not break you. Whoever set out to defeat you could not stop you. You're still here. God still has a plan for your life. Jesus is still on the throne. Salvation is still yours. And eternity for you is still secure. If you choose to follow God, there is nothing that can stop you if you continue to walk forward on the path that God has called you to take. And his roadmap for you does not not involve quitting. It doesn't involve quitting. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, don't quit. Look at your other neighbor this morning and say, you're just three feet away. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them with me this morning. You can turn to Galatians chapter six. We're gonna get there in a moment. But before we do, I got a quote for you. Napoleon Bonaparte said, no man is ever whipped until he quits in his own mind. No man is ever whipped until he quits in his own mind. I wanna let you know, failure is seldom physical and it's very often psychological. Have you ever encountered somebody and you've looked at them and said, man, they're so much stronger than I am. I wanna let you know that even the people that you look at as stronger than you still have bad days. The people that you look at as the pillars in your life, they still cry from time to time. Everybody experiences loss, difficulty, hurt, and brokenness. The reason why you view them as strong is not because of anything to do with their physical capability and everything to do with their mental fortitude that no matter what happens, they're not gonna stop. I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna quit. I'm not gonna turn around and go back home. I'm not going back the way that I came from. And most people give up too soon. Most people give up too soon. And you will forever be remembered, not by how you started, but by how you finished. Are you listening? You will forever be remembered not by how you started, but by how you finished. Any NASCAR fans in the house? Let me see some hands. Big NASCAR fans. Let me see. Raise, raise them high. Raise the high, high hands. NASCAR fans. Shame on you guys, okay? You guys need to watch a real sport. <laughs> what are you, watching cars go in circles? <laughs> Just kidding. They're like, I'm never lifting my hand in church again. Any NASCAR fan will tell you it doesn't matter who's winning at the beginning of the race. Are you listening? It matters who crosses the finish line first at the end. It doesn't matter how you start. Somebody could start out really quick out of the gate, and anybody that ever runs a race will tell you that it's foolish to worry about how you start. You can blow through all your gasoline, you can blow through all your energy, and you don't have what it takes to get to the end of the race because you weren't thinking about the finish when you started and you weren't prepared to finish well. Most people give up too soon. And the only way to experience victory is to complete your journey. And your roadmap might not look like somebody else's. It may have detours, bumpy roads. It might have a bridge or two out. It could have some potholes in it, but Christ is still the destination for all of us. Are you moving towards him? Are you moving towards him? Sometimes, man, we get so preoccupied with how somebody else's journey looks. Well, it looks easier for them. If only my life looked like theirs, then I could do what they've done. No, listen to me. All of our journeys are different. You're an individual. God created you unique. Your experiences and your choices are going to take you down unique paths. But ultimately, we're all headed towards Christ, so don't give up and don't be so preoccupied with how somebody else's journey is going. Instead, look at your journey and say, no matter what happens, no matter what comes my way, I'm not going to give up and I'm not going to quit. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says this, so let's not get tired of doing what's good. Let's not get tired of doing what's good. I want you to turn to your neighbor this morning and say, don't get tired. I want to turn to your other neighbor this morning and say, you look tired. You need some coffee. <laughs> Man, I've seen some of you guys come in. You got those raccoon eyes this morning. You need some caffeine. Throw on a pair of sunglasses and grab a coffee today. 
Don't get tired of doing what is good. Listen to this. This is so important. I want you guys to listen. At just the right time, we will receive a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. At just the right time. God, why, why, God, I need it to be on my time. No, at the right time. No, God, I need it to be now. No, now is not the right time. Tomorrow is. God, I can't wait until tomorrow. Then you won't reap the blessing because tomorrow is when's right. You're not ready for it today. You wouldn't appreciate it today. It's not my timing for you today. But if you don't get tired of doing what is right, you will reap a harvest. You're just three feet away from gold. Don't stop doing what's right. But real talk, can we, can we get real for a minute, church? Is this a church of real people, people with real problems, people with real lives? Can I see some hands waving around like I am a human being, I have bad days. If you're a perfect person, I don't know what, you do, what you're doing coming here because we're not, we'll probably mess you up. So <laughs> go have church by yourself somewhere. You just need to just ask God to take you to heaven real quick. But real talk, sometimes it's hard to do the right thing, isn't it? Sometimes it's really hard to do the right thing. Sometimes it's just a lot easier to vent about how difficult things are, isn't it? Feels good, doesn't it? when things are difficult, to talk to somebody about it. But man, if we're being honest, I I believe that sometimes we're just looking for somebody to validate our frustration. You know what I mean, don't you? We're looking for somebody to validate our frustration. Girl, you don't need him. Leave. You don't need no man. You don't need that in your life, sweetie. No, girl. We're just looking for somebody to validate our frustration. I'm really, really mad. And right now, all I want you to do is just agree with me. Anybody ever feel that way before? You ever ever try talking to somebody and they try to tell you to do the right thing and you are not having it? Anybody? Did you see the way they talked to me? Yeah, but you probably shouldn't have slapped them. You are supposed to support me. I thought you were my friend. We just want somebody to validate our frustration. We just want somebody to say, yeah, they're so mean, aren't they? They suck. (laughs) And if we're really being honest, what we're actually looking for is permission to quit. Amen? Amen? You got, if this is true, just say an amen every once in a while so I know that what I'm preaching is the word of God and not just me saying what I want to say. Sometimes when life gets hard, sometimes we present our problems and our situation in such a way that we are looking for permission to quit. We're looking for somebody to look at us and say, you don't need that in your life anymore. Give up. Walk away. Enough is enough. Cut your losses. Turn your back. You don't deserve that. We're looking for permission to quit. We're looking for someone to make us feel better just enough to where we don't have to change. Thank you. We're looking for somebody that isn't caring enough to risk our wrath and tell us to do the thing that deep down in our spirit we know we ought to do, but in our flesh we want to run from. Are you with me? Don't quit. Don't quit and don't get tired of doing the right thing. Because we all face problems. What we have to do is change our mentality and how we view problems because what we focus on is what we see. What we focus on 
is what we see. I was on Instagram a while ago and I saw a, a picture from Steve Martin, the actor. He's a comedian as well. And he posted this picture. He was in Hawaii on vacation with his family. And it was a picture from a little, a little ways back. And it was this beautiful beach. How many of you guys, you wish you were on a beach right now? Let me see some hands. You wish you were on a beach. You guys should wish you were in church, okay? Get your priorities straight, okay? Okay, Jesus saw that just now. Shame, shame. You guys are like, this guy tricks people a lot. I'm not sure I'm ever gonna lift my hands. But he was on this beautiful beach and the water was just crystal clear and the sky was blue. And I'm sure it was a perfect temperature, not like Florida where you think, oh, going to beach is a good idea and you get out there and you're like, oh, I just stick to everything. I mean, it was, the weather was great. And, 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 and the trees were green and all this stuff and it was just beautiful, like postcard status. And it was just a beautiful sandy beach. And he had positioned himself directly behind a palm tree. And the palm tree was right in front of his face. Completely beautiful beach and scenery everywhere else. But he positioned himself behind the only palm tree in the picture. And it's right in front of him. And the caption said, what a terrible view. What you focus on is what you see. Right here, it's a terrible view. But right here, you can see the promises of God. Are you with me? Right here is my problem, and right here is my victory. Ha. 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 It's all a matter of perspective. What you focus on is what you see. What you focus on is what you see. What you emphasize is what you realize. And I don't know about you, but I don't wanna obsess about my problems. I wanna obsess about my savior. I don't wanna focus on my bad. I wanna focus on his good. Are you with me, church? Are you listening this morning? Because every single person, if you have a pulse, you're gonna feel this at some point in your life. Every person in all of human history has experienced this thing in common, that desire to quit. That desire to quit. That person that you've looked up to your entire life there's been a time in their life, probably more than you realize, where they felt like giving up. Some of you, you came from a great home and you had great parents and had a great marriage and you admire that and you want that in your life. There was a time where they wanted to quit. Some of you, man, you're, you're, you're looking at somebody in ministry. There was a time where they wanted to quit. Every pastor, every husband, every wife, every father, every mother, every child, every friend, every aunt, uncle, grandmother, every boxer, every runner, every president, every leader, everybody has felt the desire to quit. Everybody. But this morning, I wanna encourage you, don't give up. You're just three feet away from victory. And you're gonna feel that desire to just give up. And when you do, I want you to remember these words this morning. Listen to me. You do not have permission to quit. You do not have permission to give up. You have to keep on going. You have to keep fighting. You have to keep on pressing on. You do not have permission to quit. Are you listening this morning, Victory? Are you paying attention to me, woman of God? You do not have permission to quit on that passion that God's put within your spirit. Are you listening? Do you hear me, man of God? You don't have permission to give up on the ministry just because it's difficult and because nobody believes in you right now. Do you hear me, husband, in this room this morning? You do not have permission to quit on your wife because she's not coming to church and she's not experiencing a relationship with God. Do you hear me, mother, in the 
the room this morning, you don't have permission to quit on your child just because they grew horns and a pointy tail before they left church this morning. Are you listening? You don't have permission to give up just because the situation got difficult. You do not have permission to quit just because life is harder than you thought it would be. You don't have permission to stop just because you expected things would be easier than they have been. You don't have permission to get bitter just because somebody else's journey looks simpler than you. You don't have permission to feel sorry for yourself because that doesn't get you through the valley that you found yourself in. The only thing that does is opening up that roadmap that Jesus gave you called his word and following it through to glory. Are you listening? You don't have permission to quit. Say, I will not quit. I will not quit. Because we all feel that desire at some point and you have to determine in your mind, I'm not going to give up no matter how hard the road is. You have to make your mind up before you get there. Are you listening? That's why we factor that into our marriage vows. Have you ever noticed that? For better or for? Sometimes it's just worse. Some of you guys are like, worse is Sunday morning. For rich or for? In health or in? We incorporate that into our wedding vows because we know marriage is hard. Some of you guys, you grew up on a steady diet of Disney movies and Nicholas Sparks and it's wrong. There's no just around the river bend. That's not it. It's just around the pick up your clothes and put it in the laundry. That's what it is. We incorporate those into our vows because we know that there's gonna be days where we feel like giving up, but marriage is about perseverance. Marriage is saying, I love you enough to keep going. Marriage is about looking at another person and saying, I've met a lot of people in my life and I've loved some people, but I choose you because I've loved other people and they're not in my life anymore, but I choose you that even when things get hard, I'm not gonna back down. Even when I feel like slapping you upside the back of your head, I will love you. Even when mentally I'm doing this, physically I will do this. And I'm not gonna quit. And I have to make that up in my mind before I get there. That's why for me and my wife, when we got married, we wrote into our marriage vows for better or worse, sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer. And we added the word to forever remove the word divorce from our vocabulary. Because I've heard too many people that are married and they get into arguments and they say words that cut and scar. And they throw that around and then that becomes an option for them. And me and my wife in our entire nearly 10 years of marriage have never used the word divorce to one another, not once. Because we made up our mind, we're not going there. Oh, and that's not to say it hasn't been difficult. I mean, she married me. That's, <laughs> that's not a recipe for an easy life, okay? That's not like, I, and I, I, every day, man, I thank God for my wife's poor judgment, but <laughs> there are days where it's hard, but we've made up our minds. We got to figure it out. I don't know what to do with this particular situation that just popped up. It's new, but quitting isn't an option. So I go forward and I keep fighting. And me and my wife have counseled a lot of people in marriage. And what I have seen is that every marriage that has come back from the edge has had at least one spouse that wasn't willing to quit. You know, it's funny. It doesn't always take two. Sometimes it just takes one. One that's like, I'm not going to quit on you. Even when the other one is quitting themselves, I'm not going to quit 
So you can go and mope and cry and drag your sorry self around, but I am committed to you. I made a promise to you. I made a vow to you, and I'm not going anywhere. You can't get rid of me. And whenever I do marriage counseling with folks, the very first question I ask, people come in, I've heard every story, every single story you could possibly imagine. The very first question I ask every single time is, do you want to work things out? Do you want to work things out? Because if you do, the problems, while we do need to deal with them, become irrelevant. We can work through anything if you have determined in your mind, I'm not ready to quit. We can overcome any problem if I'm willing to do whatever it takes. You have to be willing to do whatever it takes if you want to accomplish things and see success in your life and achieve your victory. Me and my wife, we just had the pleasure of going up to uh, Seattle and spending some time with a really massive church out there and their pastor who was really gracious. I don't know why, but he invited me and Ashley to come up and hang out with him and his staff. And, and uh, he's got a big ministry and, and, and just influencing a lot of people. And I was sitting down with him one of the days while we were up there and I asked him, I said, Pastor, what are you looking for? Because you spend so much time pouring into people and developing people and discipling people. What is the one thing that you look for when deciding who you want to invest your time into? And immediately he answered, I'm looking for somebody who's willing to do the hard thing. He said, too many people are looking for a shortcut and easy way out. I am looking for the person who is willing to do whatever it takes to do the right thing. And if I find that person, I don't care how talented they are. I don't care how intelligent they are. I don't care what kind of a background they come from. If you are willing to do the right thing, I am willing to invest my life into you. Are you with me? Are you willing to do the hard things this morning? Are you willing to fight when you need to fight? Are you willing to go to bat for your brother or your sister? Are you willing to go into a situation time and time again and do the right thing even when other people are doing the wrong thing? Are you willing to stop looking for somebody that gives you permission to quit and start looking for somebody that challenges you to keep fighting? Don't quit. Don't quit on your marriage. Don't quit on your kids. Don't quit on your career. Don't quit on your passion. Don't quit on your calling. Don't quit on your purpose. Don't quit on your destiny. Don't quit. Don't give up. You're just three feet away from the promise. Keep going. Keep digging. Keep fighting. Keep praying. Keep believing. Don't give up. Say it with me this morning. I will not quit. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Starting in verse 1, I'm reading out of the message translation for this, so it might sound a little bit different. But I just love the language that it uses here. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 1, it says this. Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and, what does it say? Never quit. Christians, look at me. Look at me. You're wondering why you're having difficulty in your spirituality it's because you quit on prayer. Amen? Amen? You quit on prayer. Jesus says it is necessary. He doesn't say it's optional. He doesn't say it is advisable. He says it is necessary to pray consistently. That means regularly and don't stop. Pray and don't quit. And he said, there was once a judge in some city who never gave God a thought and cared nothing for people. And a widow in that city kept after him saying, my rights have been violated, protect me. And he never gave her the time of day. But after this went on and on, he said to himself, I care nothing for what God thinks. And I care even less about what people think. But because this widow won't stop badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her nagging. <laughs> then the master said, do you hear what the judge, corrupt as he is, is saying? So what makes you think that God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people who continue to cry out for help? Won't he stick up for them? I assure you, he will. He will not drag his feet, but how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on earth when he returns? I want to let you know, church, this verse is telling us that God is faithful. 
God is faithful. He's never gonna quit on you, so don't you quit on him. Are you listening, church? Don't give up. He's saying, if you have this kind of persistent faith, if you keep on pressing in, if you keep on believing, if you keep on fighting, there will be a victory at the end of that. Don't stop it. That's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, uh, attitude that God has towards you. God's saying, I'm never going to give up on you. If this evil judge would answer this woman's plea, how much more does your good father want to answer yours? But my question for you is, will you have the same persistence towards God that he has towards you? How many people will he find with this kind of persistent faith? Because God is faithful. Are you? Because it's easy, man. It's easy when, when, when everything's good, isn't it? It's just real, real easy. Sometimes we just pray for the easy times. And you know what? In a room this size, there's one thing I'm sure of. I'm sure that there are people in here and probably maybe right now things are going great for you and you're feeling good and you were excited to come to church this morning and you woke up and you, you put on your best clothes and you took a shower for once and you like used deodorant and we are so thankful for that. God bless you. And you came to church this morning and you're in it, man. Like you're in it. And you're, you're, on a, you're on one of the, the teams and you're serving here and you're helping out with the kids' ministry or you're greeting people when they come in the building and you got this big old smile on your face and you're carrying a Bible that's so heavy it's gonna give you back problems later in life and you come in here and you're just so excited and, and so thrilled and everything's going well and, and when worship happens, you lift your hands and you got into it today because it was good and you worshiped God and, and you're gonna pray for, over your food when you go get lunch today and you're just so full of the spirit and you're not going to persevere to the end you're not going to make it because things are good right now but you're not guaranteed tomorrow and tomorrow you wake up and things are hard and you're like God where are you God where did you go and God's like I'm just as with you as I was yesterday when everything was all right I never went anywhere See, the amazing thing about God is that God isn't just with you in the high times. God's with you in the low times. The problem is, is that we feel like God's abandoned us in the low times when in reality, he's the only thing that gives us strength to get through them. And some of you in here, man, like, I've been a Christian for a long time, man. I've been a Christian my whole life. And you know what breaks my heart is there are people that were on fire for God and they didn't make it. There are people that I can think of, I can think of name after name after name of people that sat in this room that I thought, man, they're gonna do amazing things for God. I could see the purpose and the calling and the destiny of God in their life, but they didn't make it. For whatever reason, they gave up. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't quit. If you want to make it, if you want to go the distance, you've got to change. You've got to change. On the same trip where Ashley and I were talking with this pastor, we were speaking with uh, his, his daughter. And his daughter has been, uh, you know, she's a pastor's kid brought up, and now she's in ministry herself, and she's raising her kids, and her hope is that her kids will be in ministry, and there will be a generational thing going on there. And, and I was talking to her and I asked her, I said, man, as somebody that's grown up in the church, you've been a Christian your whole life, you've watched your parents in ministry, and now you're in ministry yourself, like, how do you do it? What's, what's your secret? What's the one thing that you have learned that has sustained you in the difficult times? And she said, if you want to make it, if you want to go the distance, you have to have a thick skin and a soft heart. You have to have a thick skin and a soft heart. The thick skin because there are gonna be people that break your heart. There's gonna be people that betray you. There's gonna be people that stab you in the back. The fiery darts of the enemy are gonna be lobbed at you for the rest of your life. And you have to have skin that's thick enough that no matter what comes, it's not gonna penetrate. It's not gonna break through. It's not going to crush me. I'm not gonna be broken by this. It's not gonna be comfortable when it lands, but it's not gonna take me out. 
but I also have to remember that I need to have a soft heart because just because this person betrayed me doesn't mean I should give up and stop loving that person. My heart stays soft so that God can continue to use me. I'm not gonna give up on his purpose. I'm not gonna give up on my ministry. I'm not gonna give up on my calling. I'm not gonna give up on his people just because other people have hurt me, just because I've failed in the past, just because things didn't go my way. I'm not gonna stop believing. I'm coming to a close this morning, and if you can, I just want you to open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 12. We're gonna be done very shortly. I just need you to bear with me for just another moment. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse one, it says this. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on. I wanna let you know, you might feel like you're the first person to face what you've faced. There are a history of people that have come before you that have blazed your trail. The only reason that you're able to come into this church this morning and worship God freely and not be praising God from the floor of a coliseum about to be fed to lions is because somebody else already went there and blazed that trail. And the Bible says, all these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans are cheering us on. They've already fought their battle. They've already got through to the other side. They're with Christ in heaven right now. They have finished their race. They have kept their faith, and they are believing that you're gonna do the same thing, that their sacrifice wasn't in vain. It says this, it means that we better get on with it. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, get on with it. We better strip down and start running and never quit. No extra spiritual fat. Do you understand religion isn't going to get you through this? You're not going to be able to overcome the adversity that you face in your life because you have a Thomas Kincaid painting hanging on your wall and it just gives you hope. That's not going to cut it. You're not going to be able to make it through whatever difficulty stands in front of you because you have a Beth Moore book that's really good on your nightstand. That's not going to be enough. You're not going to be able to make Make it in the darkest days because you have that nice cross around your necklace. That extra spiritual fat isn't going to cut it. It's not enough. It also says no more parasitic sins. You have sins that you allow into your life that are trying to leech from you your desire to persevere. They're trying to pull it out. You have doubt. You have discouragement. You have envy. You have bitterness. And all these things are parasitic sins that are telling you to give up and to quit. But it says keep your your eyes on Jesus, who never quit. Keep your eyes on him, who both began and finished this race that we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish, in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. He could put up with the cross, with shame, whatever. And now he's there in that place of honor, right alongside God. And when you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again and again, item by item, that long litany of hostility that Christ plowed through, and that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. I want to let you know, church, if you get discouraged, remember that he made a way for you. There might be days where you feel like the cost of perseverance is too great. Just remember, he already paid the price. There might be situations where you feel lost. Just remember that he is the way. There might be moments where you feel like you can't walk. Just remember that he is there to carry you. Jesus is enough. He is with you. He's gone where you're going. He's been where you've been. He suffered more than you'll ever understand. And he paid the ultimate price so that you could have victory through him. And there is a host of veterans and trailblazers that have gone before you, that have paved the way, that are cheering you on, saying, keep on going. Don't you stop now. Don't you hang your head, my daughter. Don't you cry one more time, my son. Pick yourself back up. Grab yourself by the bootstraps. You stand back up. You get to your feet, you shout a cry of victory, saying, I will not quit. I will not.
not be defeated because he is my rock and my fortress and my strength. So who shall I fear when Christ is my roadmap? Give God a shout of praise in this house this morning, church. Give God a shout of praise, I said. Give God a shout of praise like people that know that they have a hope and a purpose. Did you hear me when I said give God a shout of praise? Let's do it.